Well, it is good to be, to be with you uh, again this week. It's always a blessing to bring the, the message. And now, uh, two weeks in a row as we uh, wrap up our series, Sent. And today, we are going to attempt to look back and look forward at the same time. Now, you may think that this is impossible, but... It is, in fact, possible. You see, the Old Testament, and especially the prophets, they allow us to look back and look ahead all at the same time while giving us practical application for today. So if you will, I would would love for you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. And while you are turning there, uh, let me give you some some background. It, It was over a period of several hundred years years that Israel had forgotten God's covenant. That if you follow me, if you obey me, I will bless you. Very simple covenant. If you follow me, if you obey me, I will bless you. You will be the envy of all the other nations. In fact, I am setting you in this place For my namesake, I am allowing you to minister to the other nations, and it's very simple. If you obey, things will be good. You will be blessed. You'll be the envy of other nations, and other nations will come to you and look to you, and my name will be made Great, And that was, the, that was the covenant. But because Israel had forgotten God's covenant, they were taken into captivity. And the foolishness of Israel led them captive to Babylon. In Ezekiel 37, it is a story of hope, but it is also a picture of Jesus and how he will one day establish his, his church. And we see God's willingness to intervene in the lives of those who have given into their own foolishness. And I don't know about you, but sometimes that is me. Sometimes it is so easy for me to give in to my own foolishness And I need God to intervene on my behalf. In Ezekiel 37, it shows a picture of God intervening in the foolishness of Israel. And we also see God's promise to redeem and restore those that he breathes his breath into. So if you will, turn with me to Ezekiel 37. And while you're turning there... I often wonder, I often ponder about impossible situations, impossible situations, and wonder if God is taking notice. You may look at the state of the world and say, well, this is an impossible situation. All of the things that we have going on, maybe you are looking at your finances and the 401k is not what it used to be. The retirement is, is way down than what it was a couple of years ago. And you're wondering, is God taking notice of what's going on in the world? Is God taking notice of my dwindling finances? Maybe you're looking at some sort of personal relationship. Maybe you are here today and you've done everything that you can do. Maybe you have raised your child in church. Maybe you took them to church every time the door was open and something just didn't click with that child. And now they are wandering and they are lost. And you are looking at this impossible situation. You are wondering, is God taking notice? Maybe you're going to meet with some family today, and there's just some impossible family members. And I can tell you, if you can't think of any impossible family members, then you're the family member. (laughs) But there's these impossible situations, 
And we wonder, is God taking notice? And can God bring good out of these difficult situations? In Ezekiel, he asked the same thing. Can God do the impossible? So let's look at Ezekiel 37. And it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he sat me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, only you know. Can God do the impossible? In fact, God asks what seems to be an impossible question. Can these bones live? And humanly speaking, no. If you look at the text that we just read, these bones were very dry. They had been dry for a long time. They had been dead for a long time. These were sun-baked bones. They had been dead for a long time, and there was a great many of them. But I want you to notice that Ezekiel, he is placed in the middle of this valley. It's not that he was able to hover over and get a bird's eye view. It's not that God took him to the edge of this valley. No, he was placed in the middle of the valley where he had to swim through and there was a skull right there and a femur bone right there and there's a finger and a toe and he's swimming right here in the middle of this valley, right here in the middle of death and God is asking an impossible question, can these bones live? And I think that Ezekiel gives the perfect answer. Well, God, only you know. God, I don't know if these bones can live. Humanly speaking, no, they can't, but you are God and I am not. So I'm going to let you decide if these bones can live. And when we look at our own personal situations and we look at all of the impossibilities that we have in life, these impossible situations, sometimes we need to answer like Zeke, Ezekiel, and say, God, only you know what's going to happen. And I'm going to put my trust in you. And he's in this valley. Not only is he in the middle of this valley, but he's in this valley. In this valley, it represents the low places in life. And that's a lot like impossible situations when you are at your lowest, when you are crying out to God to intervene and to do something. And this is where we see Ezekiel. Well, God, I don't know if these bones can live, but you do. And in verse 4, it picks up and it says, Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones. And say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay tendons upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And right here, Ezekiel, he simply just responds in obedience. He responds in obedience. God asked him to prophesy, and really that just means to, to preach. I want you to preach over these bones. I want you to speak life over these bones. I want you to use your breath. As you all know, breath is important to life. You can't live without breath in your lungs. That's, that's pretty elementary. We all know that, that breath, it is, in, it, it, it is vital to, to, our, um, to, to being able to sustain life, that breath, it is vitally, vitally, vitally important. 
And so we ask this, will God do the impossible? God is asking, God is asking Ezekiel to prophesy, to speak over these bones. He says, I want you to speak. I want you to breathe life into these bones. And we know that breath is vitally important. And you may not know this, but at one point in time, I was actually in really good shape. I know that it doesn't look like that now, but at one point in time, a couple of years ago, I was like, uh, what, 40 pounds lighter? That's when Kelsey was, was looking at me, and she says, oh, man, what a hunk. He's, he's 40 pounds lighter. He's 170 pounds, and he can lift 285 pounds on the bench press. That was my max. Now, for some of you who may not lift weights, you're thinking, man, that is a lot. But if you're in the weight lifting community, that's like still baby weight. Like it's not anything special until you get to about 315. And I was on my way there and then I met Kelsey and then, man, health took a, uh, it took a, a second chair and Kelsey took that first chair. And so um, she made sure that she held on to me and she did that with good cooking, but I want to tell you that, I want to tell you that when you are lifting weight, it is so important. Your breathing is so important. And I knew that if I packed the weight onto the bar, there's a breathing technique, and when you get the bar down to your chest, and when you start to push up, that is when you want to begin to exhale. And I knew that as long as I had breath in my body, that I could push that up, and sometimes with help, but I learned that breath is important, and it matters how you breathe, because if you do not breathe properly, there is a chance that all of that weight will come crashing down on your chest, and that is a bad day in the weight room. It's a bad day. And so it's not only important that you breathe, but it's also important in situations how you breathe. And what I'm getting at is God has called us to speak life over people. And you can speak death over people, and you can speak life simply by your words. And God has called us not to just prophesy, but to speak life into people. Let's pick up in verse 7. And we see Ezekiel's obedience here. He says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were tendons on them, and flesh had come upon them, and the skin had covered them. But... There was no breath. And so, can God do the impossible? Will God do the impossible? And will God fulfill his promises? And so, when we look at this rattling, this rattling, it simply just represents that God is fulfilling his promise in verse 4. God is fulfilling the promise, and this rattling is the sound of God's power on display. If you look up this word rattle, I mean, this was a, a valley full of bones. There were many bones, and this was like an earthquake of a sound of bones coming together, of God fulfilling his promise. So if you can imagine Ezekiel, he's in the middle of this valley, in this low place in life. The bones are scattered everywhere. He begins to prophesy. And when he begins to prophesy, God begins to fulfill his promise. And when his promises are fulfilled, the bones start coming together. And it is an earthquake of a sound. And it simply reminds me of God's power on display. And when you look at Genesis 1, 3, it says that God created the heavens and the earth, and then God said, let there be light. And when God said with his breath, let there be light, light shot out of the mouth of God, power on display. We also read in Psalms 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, 
The heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And I don't think that we fully understand that we believe in a star-breathing God. That is how powerful the breath of God is. So when he tells you to prophesy over something, when he tells you to preach over something, you have God's power backing you. The same God who spoke light into existence, the same God that simply breathes out stars. And then we see the tendons and we see the ligaments and this represents the repair work that God wants to do in our life. We come here each and every week, and, and some of us even on Wednesdays, and we, and we look and we, God, we, we have some repair work that needs to be done, and that's why it's so important to go into a small group. That's so important to, to find a Bible fellowship class or a Wednesday night small group that God wants to do some repair work on you. And so when God is bringing the ligaments together, when the bones are coming together, And he's holding those bones through the ligaments and the tendons. That just simply represents the repair work that God wants to do in your life. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of repair work that God needs to do in my life. There's a whole lot of edges that need to be smoothed in my life. And right here, this is a representation of God being willing to reach out his hand and do some repair work in your life in my life, but that's not all. He even references the skin. There's going to be skin that cover these skeletons that flesh will appear. They're they're going to be held by tendons and flesh. And then skin is going to cover this corpse at this point. And that simply represents God's protection over you and I, that when we sit under the Word of God, when we apply the Word of God, that is God's protection over you and I, that if we do what God says, if we obey, there's some protection there. And in verse 9, It says, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. And at this point, at this point, God, he has fulfilled his promise. These bones are beginning to live. They've come together. They're being held by tendons. Flesh is appearing. Skin has covered them. But at this point, they are still a corpse. And God says, hey, listen, I need you to prophesy to the breath. He says, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain that they may live. So Ezekiel, he prophesied as he was commanded. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And this is God's awakening in his redemptive work. When God's breath comes into you, it's God's redeeming work. It's his redemptive work in your life. And this reminds me a lot of Luke chapter 7, if you will turn there. Luke chapter 7, and, and we're going to start in, in verse 11. And I'll read this really quickly. But we see, we see here in this passage of Scripture that all of these things that Ezekiel has done, God is doing right here in, in Luke chapter 7. It says, he went to a town called Nain. It's a very small town out of, outside of Nazareth, and his disciples and a great crowd went with them. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, And she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, 
do not weep. Well, Jesus, what do you mean, do not weep? My son, my only son, has died. And there wasn't a lot of options for women back in those days. And she knew to get by in life was very limited. The things that she had to do was very limited. She couldn't, she couldn't just go out and get another job that easily. And Jesus says, do not weep. Then he came up and he touched the coffin and the bearers stood still. And I want you to just picture here for a minute this picture of Jesus. He comes up on this town and he shows up in the middle of a bad situation. You might even say an impossible situation. And he comes upon this funeral procession. And they're carrying out this young man. People are weeping. And Jesus, he stands there with his disciples in the middle of this impossible situation, this low point in life for the widow. People are crying. They're upset. And Jesus finds himself in the middle of this funeral procession as they are going through the gate. And Jesus shows up. And he's about to change the game for this widow. You see, Jesus, he comes by and he touches the coffin. But not only that, I want you to pick up on something. It says that the bears, they stood still. And with the breath of Jesus, he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And look what happens. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. The words of Jesus are not only preached, they're not only said, but Jesus backs up his claim. It would have looked very foolish if Jesus would have said, get up, and there was no power in the breath of Jesus. He would have been the laughing stock of that community. What do you mean, get up? You can't raise the dead. But the words of Jesus are successful Because there's power in his words. And as we sit under his teaching, his words are bringing us to life. They are reviving us. And sometimes we realize that the impossible, oh, it is definitely possible. The words of Jesus are successful. And as we flip back to Ezekiel, we see that there is an exceedingly great army. This is not just some small army. No, this is, this is a great army of great numbers. And the army right here, it represents purpose. And the last time I checked, armies don't just sit in their barracks and play cards. No, they are given a purpose. And I know that you guys are probably tired of hearing me talk about my baby girls. Well, guess what? We've got about 17 more years of me standing up here talking about my baby girls. Because they are precious and they teach me so much about God. You see, I don't want to just raise my girls to be successful. I mean, yes, I want them to be successful. I want them to be exceedingly successful. But in order to do that, I have to speak life into them. And every morning, and you can check this story with Kelsey, I'll pick up Corley. 
and I'll get her ready for the day. And I'll take her to the bathroom mirror and I'll stand her up. I'll brush her hair. And I say, baby, are you strong? She says, yes. I said, Corley, are you brave? She says, yes. Well, Corley, are you smart? Yes. Corley, are you kind? She says, yes, Daddy. And I say, Corley, does your family love you? She says, yes, Daddy. And then I always end, baby, does, does Jesus love you? And she resounds with, yes. And it's funny that when you speak life into somebody, they tend to believe it. The other day I was getting ready for work and I was going to grab my, my backpack and it was full of books and Corley, she looks up with me and she's, Daddy, do you need your backpack? And I said, yes, baby, I'm going to go get it. And next thing I know, she's carrying this backpack that probably weighed just as much as she does. And I mean, she's like carrying it like this far off the ground, kind of dragging it. And I'm like, baby, how did you get that? And she said, Daddy, I'm strong. I said, you sure are, baby. That will be something that I do. Not just for Corley, but Zoe too. To the day that they leave my house. Baby, are you strong? Are you brave? Are you tough? Are you kind? Are you smart? Does your family love you? Does Jesus love you? And the answer is always yes. You see, we have an opportunity and we are being sent to speak life into people. And when God, when the people of God are conditioned to believe and expect that the impossible can be done, well, you better believe extraordinary things will happen. I'm not just raising two little girls. I'm raising warriors for Jesus. So you may ask, how can God restore the broken? How can God set the captive free? How can God give purpose to the fallen? And how can God raise up the dead? These all seem like impossible questions. And some of you may be wrestling with these questions today. And we ask ourselves, how? And it is simply through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus And when we come here today, Jesus, he is speaking over you, ready to revive you, ready to do his redemptive work. Because I don't know what you came here with. Maybe you need some repair work. Maybe you need God's protective work over you. But God is here. And he's saying, listen, whatever it is that you need... Whatever it is that you need, it can be found right here at the foot of the cross. There is peace at the cross. And you may not know all of the answers to the impossible questions, but there is peace. And as I sit wandering like Ezekiel, the peace of God covers me. And I know 
that no matter what happens, no matter what life throws at me, oh, God is good. And when I enter into his presence, there is peace. A peace that passes understanding. Will you bow your heads with me, Father? I pray that in the coming year, that some of these questions will be answered. But Father, if some of these questions linger, Father, I pray that your peace would cover each individual. And Father, I pray that we would be that exceedingly great army that goes into the neighborhood here at Morningside, that goes into our workplace and into our schools. And Father, that we would speak life into people. Father, for your glory, for your namesake. Father, can these bones live? Humanly, humanly, no, it's impossible. But Father, with you, all things are possible. Amen.